Pastor Simon Assam is a, a journalist based in London. He's originally from Lebanon. Uh, and he's speaking tonight as part of an organisation called MENA, which is the Middle East and North African Solidarity Network. And this was an organisation set up in the early days of the Egyptian uprising. And it brought together a group of people nationally here in Britain who wanted to show solidarity to what was happening in the Middle East and see what they could do to help. So Simon's going to talk about the political implications of what's happening in Syria in the Rida region. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, brother. Um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to Manchester as well. Um, I just wanted to say that I think this is, these days are very hard. And I think it's very easy for us, both here and in Syria, to simply slip into despair and see that this is uh, going to be a never-ending war, or that the revolution is gone and is finished, and that this has now become a sectarian civil war in which we will not see the end of it. And of course, coming from a Lebanese, this you know, must seem strange, because you know, I, I, Nahla was asking me how I introduced myself, I would say I'm Lebanese, because in my heart, when we came as refugees in 1975, we were only staying for a month, and you know, 40 years later, here I still am, you know, my daughter's grown up, and so on, and so, but still, that, that, that thing, that, that thing remains. We have to be against despair, and now we have to look at the revolution, and understand that, ha that however difficult these days are, that there is something happening inside of Syria that I think is going to change it and mark it for the future, and this is what the people in Syria are fighting for, and this is, I think, the fundamental reason why every, all the good people around the world support uh, the, Syrian, uh, the, the Syrian revolution. I was going to say something about those who simply dismiss the Syrian revolution. And the Syrian people are simply being pawns in some greater game. The idea that the Syrian revolution, even some people say, it might have started off with good intentions, but since it's been taken over by, you know, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the US, Israel, Al-Qaeda, I mean, you name it, it's a huge long day. So I'm going to say it's a complete nonsense. That there is something called Syria, and there is this, uh, 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 and it is a real thing. And there is the will of the people inside of Syria, which is real. And it remains so. And they have interests outside of all, 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 all these others. It always, it always made me laugh because you, when, when people talk about it's simply, uh, and the way they do it, I think, is really dishonest. That you look at Iraq and what's, what's happening in Syria is what happened in Iraq. Well, it's not. Because in Iraq, there was an invasion of a quarter of a million troops. In Syria, this is an uprising. And so then they try and say that the people of Dara'a, or the people of Idlib, are simply somehow pawns in this, in this game, or simply playing uh, and, and, and part of it, as if they were recruited you know, by CIA or something in a bar in Shanghai or something. It's complete and utterly ridiculous. It is a real uprising. And as a real uprising, it needs no justification. And certainly needs no excuse. And we don't go putting conditions on the Syrian people for our support. Our support is with them and when they're uprising. And I think for me this is the beginning. Uh, this, this has to be absolutely the, the beginning. I want to say something else. That I think the victory is coming. And I don't just say that simply because after years of you know, civil war in Lebanon you see the end coming. That I somehow I'm just overwhelmingly optimistic, which I am overwhelmingly optimistic. But actually because you begin to see it on the ground. That actually 80% of Syria is now under the hands of the rebels, the revolutions. The key centers, uh, military bases, and so on, the regime still has hold of. And they're using these bases in order to indiscriminately bomb areas that have, fallen, that have gone over to, to the revolution. We're seeing it, we saw it in Homs, I think, in the most horrible way, but we're seeing it now everywhere else. And uh, the, the recent phenomena of rolling barrels of TNT out the back of helicopters indiscriminately onto buildings to take down a building shows you, I think, the desperation of the regime. But it also shows you something else. That when the July offensive happened, and uh, large numbers of resistance fighters and rebels poured into Aleppo, people were saying this wouldn't last. That there was huge numbers of troops now coming to clear out Aleppo. Actually, something emerged, which is the regime cannot trust its soldiers. Actually, if you see what's taking place inside the Syrian army, you know that there are hundreds, if not thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of ordinary Syrian conscripts who are being held almost as prisoners inside these military bases. And they dare not let them go. Because the moment they let them go, they go home or they join the rebellion. And if they try and then stick large numbers of troops, these troops tend to defect. And I think this shows you that even though it's hard, even though it's, it's very bloody, that actually there is some, there is this huge wheel that is turning inside of Syria. I think that's really, that, that, that's, that, that's really important, that we are, I think we are beginning to see the end. And of course, there's nothing, you know, the, you know, the darkest moment before.
dawn, as they say. And I think we're feeling now that darkest moment, and we should not, um, we should not uh, uh, let go of that dream of what it means by Syrian people are one, the Syrian people are united, but also that uh, they want Syria, which is free, with people living in dignity. I think that's really, uh, really, really important. And there's the others who say that it's a sectarian uprising. I'll tell you something. The Sunnis make up, what, 65, 70 percent of the population. This was a sectarian uprising. It would have been over months ago. Because, actually, all the Sunnis would have risen up and simply slaughtered the Alawis. This is complete nonsense. Of course it's complete nonsense. There are large sections, especially the Sunni rich and Sunni upper middle classes, who are very happy with the state of play. There is also a vast number of Alawis who are extremely unhappy with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the regime and what the regime is doing and how it's putting them in the position that it's putting in. I saw a very good report by a man called Mir, Mir Rosen where he went amongst the, 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 the Alawis. Very, very good report. Because I recognised something in it which, which took me back to my youth because we're from Christian Lebanon. So at the beginning of our civil war, or our armed uprising turned into a civil war, I heard this all the time. It's simply about the Muslims. They want to slaughter us. Look at us, how Western we are, and so on. And I recognize this. And I also recognize how false this was. Because, of course, if you look at the Syrian history, those amongst the Alawi community who opposed the Assad regime, the Ba'athist regime, usually suffered twice as hard as everyone else. And everyone else did suffer. It is, sectarianism is not something coming out of the revolution. This is the tool they use to try and break the revolution. I think we have to understand very much uh, how this works inside this sectarian system that they have. It is rich and poor, and you see this very much in the areas, and I see, and you see also uh, large numbers of Alawis as well. If you, if you go into Southern Beirut, I was there uh, in the, uh, last summer, and it was a very interesting thing I saw. Southern Beirut, of course, the Shia heartlands, Hezbollah strongholds, a place that was hammered mercilessly by the Israelis in 2006 and so on. There was a slogan on the wall, written, and as you passed by, you saw it everywhere. It was a victory to the revolution in Bahrain. This is acceptable inside the Shia areas, underneath it, victory to the revolution in Syria. Now, actually, people see this revolution, especially amongst uh, uh, the, the, uh, many sections of the, of the Lebanese population, also large numbers of young Shia as well, who see this as a genuine revolution and are furious with what is taking place in the way uh, sectarianism is attempting uh, to, 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 to be used. The Syrian revolution is part of the Arab Spring. It's not simply part of the Arab Spring because it happened at the same time as the rest of the revolution, but actually the things that driven, drove the development of the Syrian revolution are the same that drove the revolutions everywhere else. And I want to spend maybe five minutes, hopefully, uh, uh, just, just explaining what I mean by that. That if you look at the Arab Spring, there's something that strikes you. That you have an uprising in, in Tunisia. Okay, acceptable. This is a pro-Western regime and so on. Followed by an uprising in Egypt. Acceptable also. This is a pro-Western regime. And then suddenly there's an uprising in Libya. And you go, well, is this a coincidence? Or is actually, this is supposed to be an anti-imperialist regime, yet, this, yet, yet the people are rising. And then in Yemen, and then in Bahrain. And then you see it's now going to Sudan, where it actually is an Islamist regime. It's nothing to do with the nature of the regime. It has to do with the nature of the massive social changes that have taken place inside the Arab world over the last 30 years. And I hope to kind of illustrate this, and you see it in Syria as well. You see it everywhere. Which is when I was growing up in Lebanon in the 1960s, early 1970s, two-thirds of the population lived on the land. We lived in villages, really. A tiny minority, uh, you know, were living in the cities and so on. It's the same across everywhere else. And in the village, you know, it's very easy to keep people under control. And it's very, you know, very easy. Just my grandmother, seeing my grandmother was enough to keep me uh, <laughs> under control. But actually, that, that we lived in a Greek Orthodox village, and that we had nothing to do, never mind with the Shia villages, but we had nothing to do with the Maronite villages. Everyone was kept separate from everyone else. City life is different. You go into the city, you walk down the road, you meet everyone. So when we moved from the village into Beirut, suddenly I was meeting people I'd never thought I'd meet. Even, you know, the, 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 when you grow up inside this kind of sectarian system, you know, the, the people were really kind of hated, apart from the Maronites, obviously, were the Greek Catholics. I had no idea who the Greek Catholics were, but we weren't supposed to like them because we were Orthodox. Sorry. And this breaks down very, very quickly. If you look at the Arab world, you'll see, over the last 30, 40 years, a massive shift from the countryside to the city. So now when we talk about the Arab world, we're not talking about tribes wandering around deserts or people simply on the land. Actually, we're talking about it being very urban. Saudi Arabia, 80% urban. Okay. Lebanon, 80, 90% urban. Egypt, 50, 60% urban. Uh, and every single place you look, you'll see this. The second thing that happened, which was a massive change in, 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 uh, in, in education. And we talked simply about Libya in the 1950s. There was something like 10, 15% 
uh, 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 people can read and write. Really, it was as bad as that. Actually, now it's about 90%. Actually, that we, there are these fundamental changes that have taken place, but most importantly, once you get into the city, then you start finding your power. And what we saw in Syria, I think, over the last uh, 10, 15 years, has been this shift more and more from the countryside into the city. And they talk about the new neighborhoods around Aleppo and Damascus and so on. And I think the figure, someone might correct me if I'm wrong, was something like three million, two to three million people simply over the last decade moving over from one to the other. There's something else. These massive social changes have no reflection with the regimes at the top. So even though Libya today is completely different to Libya in 1969, it was still run by the same man. Same with Egypt. Same with, you know, you go every country you want, irrespective of what it calls itself, Republican or uh, uh, a, a monarchy or, or whatever. These regimes emerged from a different era, from the 1950s, from the 1960s, some from the 1930s, and Lebanon, of course, from the 1932. They remain completely unchanged, but the population underneath have changed fantastically. And so you had, inside of the Arab world, this massive build-up of pressure. Huge build-up of pressure in which there was this sense they needed something needed to, to happen. Something needed to change inside the Arab world, but the regimes would not allow it. There is another aspect, I think, that we have to understand with this, is that these regimes rested on three pillars. The first pillar was a social contract between the regimes and the population. Okay, you shut up, but you won't go hungry. You shut up, we'll subsidise your fuel. Don't say anything. Never mind, we'll, we'll ensure your children have an edu education and so on. This was again across, all, uh, across all, all the regions. Something began to change in the 19, well, some places in the 1970s, but really in the 1990s to 2000, which is the advent of neoliberalism. We all know what neoliberalism means here, but you just see what it meant in the Middle East. The cut in bread subsidies, the cut in fuel subsidies, the abolition even of the most meagre social uh, provisions actually meant you began to see large sections of the Arab population go from that just on the on the cusp of being in trouble, to suddenly finding themselves uh, in, 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 deep, in deep trouble. At the same time this was taking place, you had a massive rise in wealth amongst the, uh, you know, the, the upper echelons of the, uh, of the, of the regimes. You know, the, 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 the Egyptians joke, you know, and they said, oh, you know, we found 80 billion in the bank account of Hosni Mubarak. People go, oh, stop exaggerating, it was 20 billion. And, you know, and, you know, and, and the same with Gaddafi. How much money that they, that they managed to put in their own pockets, actually if you look across the whole of the Arab world and actually see that class, the rich have become so extraordinarily stupid rich about the majority of the population seem unable to lift themselves, in fact have been pushed further and further down. This neoliberalism actually demolished one important pillar of the regime and that was to keep people in acquiescence. Okay, <laughs> so I only got the first point. Okay, so there's a second pillar. A second pillar I call the rhetoric, and anyone, and I'm sure most of the Arabs here will know, I'm sure other people know as well, is that you would go along to these conferences in which you get the long speeches. There are brothers of Palestinians, the da, 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 imperialism, and so on and so on. This was the rhetoric. The rhetoric about Palestine was very important, because at the, one, at the same time as they were having this rhetoric, praising our brothers and da, 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 they were suppressing the Palestinian popular movement. And there is no regime more adept at smashing the Palestinian popular movement than Hafez al-Assad's regime and the one that followed. Because when, from, from, from Lebanon, when I think about the civil war, and at the time, we were fighting against the, what we call the progressive forces. We were, you know, relatively wealthy Christians, and we didn't want the poor people to come and take. So, you know, wrong side, sorry about that, but that's just the way it was at the time. But I remember, I remember the one thing was that we feared the Syrian army coming. Because if the Syrians came, then we knew that the end of the Christian domination of Lebanon would happen, the communists would take over, before you know it, we'll all be speaking with a Palestinian accent. This was the general feeling amongst them. So when the Syrian army did invade, we were completely shocked. It invaded to stop the victory of the Palestinian progressive movement. This was 1976. It was a huge surprise to us. Absolutely huge surprise, because this is not what we were expecting. Actually, what was taking place was that the same process that was taking place inside of Egypt, which was Sadat at the time, who was the ruler of Egypt, attempting to cut a deal with the Americans, with the Israelis, Hafez al-Assad was doing the same as well. And part of that deal was to suppress the uprising inside of Lebanon. So when the Syrian army came into Lebanon, they came into Lebanon to destroy the Palestinian movement and to destroy the left and the progressive forces. This was an absolute fact. And it was summed up for me in one thing that was very important to us at the time, a place called Tel Azata, which is a Palestinian camp. Because of course we were terrified of it, because we were on the wrong side. But you know, a few years later I realized it was, it, 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 it was 
ridiculous. Uh, Tatler's after was holding out this Palestinian camp, essential resistance inside the industrial belt outside Beirut. It cut the supply lines from the uh, rich, you know, the rich mountains to the phalangist sectarian militias in Beirut. The Syrian army shelled it. In Shelly, they then allowed in the Falangist militia, and what happened next, of course, we've seen time and time again. They did the same in 1983. They did the same in, 19, in what, we, what we call the, the War of the Camps. I have a Palestinian friend, actually, she now lives in London, who's a survivor of Sabra and Chatilla, of 1982. And he talked to her about it, but she doesn't want to talk about that. I expect this from the Israelis, she said, but I lost my brother in 1984. What happened to him? He was PLO, he got kidnapped by the Syrian uh, regime because they were trying to cross the PLO at the time. She never saw him again. So for her, the deep anger is not simply against the Israelis, but the way in which this betrayal happened, the way in which the regime was used to crush any movement outside of its control. And that's something I think is very important we understand, because there's people who simply see it as being the axis of resistance, or simply seeing it as, uh, as being that. No, there is a double history. It was forced at certain times to take up a stand against Israel, but actually most of the time it was attempting to crush completely the, the, the movement underneath. And this is not simply Syria, this is the rest of the Arab world. So you had the rhetoric and the promises which came to nothing. And the biggest promise was the promise about a two-state solution. We will keep the Arab street quiet. We will, uh, we will ensure there will be a two-state solution. We will say there will be no return for the Palestinians to pre-48 Palestine and so on. In return, you Americans and the Israelis will give us an a, 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 a independent Palestinian state, even though it's only Gaza and the West Bank. This was a big promise, I mean, a big promise, the 1990s. Everyone felt it, and you felt you were being lied to. But actually, when it actually came to the fact that you were lied to, people were absolutely disgusted. That all the promises of the Arab regime, irrespective of their color, still made the same promise, still made the same, uh, bro broke the same promise. Neither, as they say in Dara, uh, in, in, in the south where the revolution in Syria began, they, when they, they call on the troops the heroes of oppression, the cows of the Golan. This is, I think, exactly what it means, that they were willing constantly to use weapons against their own population, but not stand up against the, the, the Israelis. This sense, I think, of betrayal was very, very strong. So I think that's important. That's the second pillar. And you felt that pillar crumble as well. Uh, the regime's only had one pillar left which was just sheer brute repression. Because they had no legitimacy, they lost any sense of uh, connection with the population, so the only thing they could rely on was on the security services. And so when you saw the nature of the Arab Revolution, the nature of the uprisings that took place, they took a very peculiar character, which was mass demonstrations in the streets, breaking the holds of security forces. So you saw this in Libya, then you saw it massively inside of Egypt. It is, if you like, the reason why there is this level of brutality. So there is that sentiment. There is something else, I think, we have to say about the Syrian revolution, which it is very much a revolution that has come from below. And the more you look into it, the more I think I'm amazed at the, at the, uh, at the speed at which it developed. The original demonstrations were uh, uh, coordinated by something called the local coordination committees and various other, uh, what they call Syrian revolutionary organizations. These come from below. They were organically grew out of the street movements and very quickly began to develop uh, uh, the develop or, you know, a, a revolutionary leadership inside, inside of Syria. This, the LCCs, are, uh, 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 called a whole series of peaceful demonstrations. There were demonstrations, and it was amazing really, to be honest with you, of all, the, of all the events in world history, I think Syria is probably the most documented. You can watch every single demonstration on YouTube. It's quite amazing, and I do, basically, because, you know, because I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> and, and it's very, very interesting about, is, is A, the sense, the depth of it, be the sense of which this is popular, that these are ordinary people, you hear it in the accents and the, and the areas and so on. And the third thing that it strikes you constantly is that the Syrian people are one. That time, the Syrian people are one. People talk about sectarianism, I don't hear it. I'm sure there must be, but I don't hear it in the mass, in the mass demonstrations. These, this movement, this peaceful movement, about the demonstrations, around the demonstrations, and also the general strikes that followed, exposed the fact that the regime in Syria could not be reformed. It could not provide any reforms at all. This is the reason why then revolution becomes the only option. It's not like they woke up one morning and said, oh, what should we do? Should we have a peaceful movement for reform? And Bashar al-Assad leaves and we have this process like in Egypt or something? Or do we, or do we have just a violent revolution? This wasn't a choice. The violent element of it actually came out of the regime. The way in which the regime responded to these demonstrations meant there was really no alternative. Other people will talk about the timing or the nature. This, of course, is up for the debate. But that they had to 
I think became uh, very uh, uh, became extraordinarily uh, it, it came extraordinarily quickly. So we talk about the revolution as being a living organism, as something that is constantly emerging. And you read reports, especially from uh, areas inside what they call the liberated areas, where people talk about. I think in one village they have elections every three months for who is going to run the village. That's fantastic because you've gone for years in which you have false elections with one candidate, and everyone has to vote for that candidate, and some people are so enthusiastic, they vote twice, you know, as one of those kind of regimes. To actually, people are having secret ballots. Oh, fantastic. People are actually beginning to put under popular control the civil administration that is taking place in some kind of accountable way. And I think this is really important. You see this over and over again. You see the documents now beginning to appear, in which this is becoming the blueprint, the model, of what Syria under the liberated areas will look like. And you begin to see it, of course, uh, 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 still surviving despite the terrible conditions under which, under which it's going. And then there's the question, I think, about the armed resistance. We can talk about the armed resistance. I think it's very important that we distinguish between what we call the real resistance organizations, the brigades as they call them, that emerged out of the revolution. Usually from defected troops, defected officers, civilians, students, workers, so on, taking up weapons to defend their neighborhoods, and that this grew and grew and became bigger and more important. That is coming from below. And you see this, and people talk about the numbers of this. They talk about maybe 70, 80,000 men, normally men, under arms in, uh, in, uh, who, 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 who are fighting back, and fighting back more and more effectively. Because, uh, you, know, it's, 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 you know, when they talk about the Syrian uh, army, it's an army designed to withstand a war with Israel. So actually, the amount of stocks they have are for a two-year war with Israel. So to give you a sense of how much weapons are being thrown at the Syrian people. So, it's, 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 it's very much how, how they're able to, under these conditions, win over soldiers, get, get, get weapons, and so on. There is that element of it, in which we say, you know, 70, 80,000 maybe, it's more, maybe it's slightly less. But people concentrate on the Salafis, on the people coming from Iraq and so on, and they go, look, they're coming to take over. Let's get this in perspective, that these are tiny, tiny amounts. Of people. It's not the main bulk of it. And then there's the others who talk about the so-called Western-backed leadership of the Free Syrian Army and the various and the various others. And there was a very good report, but very good because it made me laugh. I think it was in Telegraph yesterday, in which they talked about the Saudi millions going in to rebuild the Syrian revolution. I'm not, I have to read this, obviously. The Saudi millions going in, and they did a report about this brigade that's being funded by the Saudis and so on. And he, and he's thinking, oh, it's very good, etc., etc. Interesting. Oh, I have to, you know, a little bit worried about it, and so on. You read the end and go, well, how big is this brigade? There's 20 people. And then 20 people, how are you spending 20 million, 30 million on 20 people? Actually, if you think of just one brigade in Homs, you're talking about 10,000. So actually, we have to be practicing very quickly, very importantly, between the fringe, little fringe things people focus on, and actually the core of the revolution, the core of the revolution itself. Another five minutes, and then I promise I'll... <laughs> I'll shut up. And so we have, if you like, inside of this, uh, 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 quite, quite a harsh and nasty uh, civil war. I use the word civil war in the traditional way. That is civilians fighting against the state. This is the original term, rather than a sectarian civil war. It's not a sectarian civil war. It's really important that, 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 that we make that distinction. Because the, the origins of the revolution was not a sectarian. Uh, if you, people take their minds back to Yugoslavia, this started as a sectarian war and continued as a sectarian war. This is not what is taking place here. Of course, Sectarianism is a danger, of course it is, we know that. It's our punishment in, the, uh, in Syria and Lebanon. It's basically our punishment for failure. We will get sectarianism, but it's not something that emerges from the revolution, uh, from, from, from the revolution itself. And we have to say, I think, something else. It's just stuff about Western intervention. Because as much as I deeply support the Syrian revolution, and I expect everyone here does as well, we have been extraordinarily weary of what the West is playing and how they see it. It's very important to understand that their influence inside the revolution is extraordinarily limited. Now, I don't just say this because I want it to be the case, but because you read the documents, and what's interesting about them is that, is that they draw up lists of people. This is you know, the documents they publish and say, maybe we can talk to this commander. Maybe this one will talk to us. Maybe that one will talk to us. Actually, they don't have that much influence at all. But also this sense, I think, from inside of Syria, in which Western intervention didn't come, it's not going to come. It has to come from, 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 from us. It's very important that the Western military intervention doesn't happen for several reasons. One is, the revolution, the legitimacy of the revolution is not simply about today or tomorrow this year. It's about the next 30, 40 years. This is very important. That it is seen as not being brought from the outside, but comes from the society as well. The legitimacy, I think, is very, very important. But for me, 
I think the overwhelming thing is, what the hell are you going to bomb? Because if you look inside the military bases, these are prisons. Do we really want Western aircraft bombing conscript prisoners? No, we don't. At all. We don't want that at all. Nor do we want Syria simply to become like Iraq. That is, people coming from the outside, taking control and leaving disaster. This has to come and remain from the inside. I'm happy for all humanitarian aid to come in. Don't get me wrong, it's not like, you know, this, this aspirin is from you know, a Western company and can't come in. I, I think that should actually come in. But, the, but, but direct Western intervention will, deliberately, will destroy the revolution. It's very important that that, 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 doesn't, play, that, that doesn't happen. The other thing I think is really, really important is that we understand that inside of this revolution, however hard it is now, that there still remains that beating heart. It still remains that uh, massive desire. And it still remains that the, uh, uh, that the revolution itself is, uh, 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 develops and deepens. That the, uh, the way in which the local coordinating committees now become the civil administration, the way in which when you read, when you see the, tomorrow, when you see the footage coming out, what they call the leaked footage from the Shabiha, the uh, regime forces and so on, you see the barbarity and the cruelty of it. Actually, when you read what the LCCs and others are saying, is a set of moral principles for the Free Syrian Army fighters to adhere to. They don't always adhere to it, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to whitewash this. But that there is an attempt constantly to remain, we are, uh, have a moral high ground here. Yeah. And it's very, very important that, 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 that we do, <coughs> excuse me, that, that we do that. That the Syrian revolution is part of the wider Arab revolutions. And that if you see, and people I think sometimes feel a little bit isolated, I know I felt a little bit isolated, and they stand up um, amongst much of the traditional left, and they go, you are the only people who support the Syrian revolution. Well, yeah, just us, the Egyptians, the Tunisians, the Yemenis, uh, and so on. Just us and the Arab revolutions support the Syrian revolution. I think it's fascinating the way in which, the, uh, uh, with, with the rise, of, especially of, of, of uh, uh, President Morsi inside of Egypt, how Syria is such an important question that actually you begin to see that this is a much, much bigger thing. The sympathy amongst the Arab world for the Syrian people is absolutely huge. And as the revolutions develop more and more inside of the Arab world, you can see a future for Syria not being isolated, but one being drawn into uh, a, a, a completely changing uh, a, 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 a changing uh, Arab world. I am so optimistic, despite the horror. I am absolutely op op optimistic, because you know, I'll make a confession. I used to drive to the Bekaa Valley, which is between Syria and Lebanon, because there used to have lovely food there. And I always used to pass the statue of Hafez al-Assad, because, you know, and I won't tell you why it's there, but it was there. And even though I was in the car with all my friends, none of us said what we thought. And I'd go back and I went, oh, one day that statue's going to come down. But I wouldn't tell any of my friends, because they'd think I'm completely mad. It wasn't until the statue started coming down that everyone started confessing, you know, I thought that would happen. <laughs> <laughs> And, then, and there's something else I have to say, which is, I never had, until the revolution, a political conversation with Syria. No, you never had, a, or a Libyan, to, for, for that matter. He never approached it. And it was very important, because our village in the north of Lebanon depended on Syrian agricultural workers to bring in the olives and so on. So it isn't like I never met a Syrian. Uh, um, when we were re re rebuilding a house in Beirut, which had been shelled despite by everybody, Syrian workers came and did it. And what was very interesting, the closest I came to a political discussion was when... You know, I asked the shopkeeper, uh, house had taken so much damage over the years, who, does you know anyone reliable? He said, yes, I know a very good guy, but he's Syrian, do you mind? I said, I don't, I don't care, does he paint? He goes, yeah, he paints, okay. So he came anyway, so we were doing a tour, and it was like a tour of the Lebanese Civil War. Because it was like, yeah, this was the Palestinians, and this rocket here, this was M16, this came from here, this came from the faction fight. So on, we did all the front. And he was going, yes, you need this here, you need that, filler, this type of filler, and so on. And we went to the behind the building, which had been hit by Syrian shelling. And he went silent. He said, this part we do for free. And I said, no, no, that's, you know, I, I don't blame you. You're not responsible for what the Syrian regime did. This was in 1989. And he went, no, 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 shut up. This we do for free. That was the closest I came to a political discussion with the Syrian. Now you can't shut them up. <laughs> really, you can't shut them up. They will talk about everything. And I think this is the fantastic thing. A woken spirit of revolution. Millions of people taking control, attempting to take control of their lives. But in the process, we have to destroy this regime. We have to destroy the regime of fear. And we have to also remember that there is, even though it's outside of our memory, because I was born in 1963, three months after 
the state of emergency went in Syria. So even all my life, I don't know anything about the state of emergency in Syria. But you read about Syria in the 1940s, the 1950s, and 1960s, understanding this was the birthplace of Arab nationalism, huge cultural explosion, huge political, it was fantastic, it was the center, I think, for many people of, 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 sort of what they call the Arab Renaissance, the Arab Renaissance culture. That was destroyed by the dictatorship that followed. And this is what you're seeing re-emerging. So I absolutely hope in the victory, uh, and I think the victory will come soon, and I'll give Syria a free and dignity.